buck converters are probably one of the most common power supply topologies in all of electrical engineering. Regardless of what electronic device you're working on, there's probably always going to be a need to step a higher voltage down to a lower voltage. In this video, we are going to do a comprehensive breakdown of the buck converter from a fundamental standpoint. We'll explore essential aspects of the design and operation of the buck converter, including key components in the circuit, the modes of operation, and all of the important theoretical concepts for you to understand. The main goal with this video is to sort of get your feet wet and get you some exposure to the buck converter before we start getting our hands dirty with some actual design work. And as always, please check the description. There's some links you might find interesting down there as well as resources that pertain to this video. And with that out of the way, let's just jump right into it. So the first thing I wanna talk about are gonna be the key components that make up the buck converter circuit. So what we're gonna do is open up TI's Power Topologies Handbook and navigate to the section on the buck converter. One of the things we'll see in this section is going to be a circuit diagram that shows what is known as the power stage of the buck converter. This refers to the components that actually do the heavy lifting and do the actual work of converting the higher voltage down to the lower voltage. First component we will talk about is going to be Q1, the MOSFET. The MOSFET's primary function is to act as a switch that connects the input voltage source to the inductor L1. So when the MOSFET is switched on, it allows current to flow from the input voltage source through the inductor. And when it is off, it disconnects the input voltage source from the inductor. So no current will flow from the input voltage source. A fun fact, this is where the term switch mode power supply actually comes from because it is the rapid switching of the MOSFET that is a key mechanism in doing the voltage conversion and also many other power supplies as well. So that's why you'll see there's a whole category of switch mode power supplies and the buck converter is just one example and they all rely on some switching of some type of MOSFET. So that's kind of where that comes from. So when you're selecting the MOSFET for a buck converter application, there are a few key parameters that you'll want to be familiar with when you know selecting the right component for your design. They are things such as the drain to source voltage rating, the current rating, the power dissipation rating, and also the general thermal properties of the MOSFET. You might also hear the term duty cycle mentioned when talking about the MOSFET in switch mode power supply applications. And this refers to the percentage of time that the switch is turned on in the operation. This impacts a lot of things in the rest of the design and understanding your duty cycle is pretty important um, when it comes to designing a buck converter. So we'll cover this topic in more detail in a later video. The next component we wanna talk about is going to be L1, the inductor. So we previously talked about how the MOSFET works with the inductor and that it acts as a switch that allows current to flow through the inductor. So what does the inductor itself do? To understand what the inductor does, you'll need to know one of the inherent properties that inductors have, which is they like to resist any changes in the current that is flowing through them. That means that once the switch is closed and the inductor is connected to the input voltage source, it will initially try to resist any changes in the current flowing through it. So we won't see an immediate current spike Instead, what we'll see is a gradual incline in the amount of current flowing through the inductor, kind of like a linear ramp. Another important property of inductors that you'll want to be familiar with is the fact that they can store energy in their magnetic fields and then release that energy at a later time. Kind of like how capacitors can store energy on their metal plates, inductors will do the same thing with their magnetic field. And what they'll do is they'll release that energy in order to prevent any changes in the amount of current flowing. There are several key parameters that you'll want to be familiar with when selecting an inductor for a buck converter application. Things like the inductance value, the RMS current rating, saturation current rating, and the equivalent series resistance. Again, don't worry if none of those terms are familiar to you. I'm just trying to give you an introduction to them and we'll discuss them in more detail in a later video. Okay, so the next component in the buck converter circuit that we're gonna talk about is going to be the output capacitor. The capacitor's job is actually kind of similar to the inductors in that it will be storing and releasing energy. The main difference is that the capacitor likes to maintain a constant voltage across its two terminals while the inductor likes to maintain a constant current flowing through it. So its job is to basically help out the inductor in maintaining a constant voltage drop across the output load. When choosing an output capacitor for a buck converter application, here are the key parameters you'll want to be familiar with. Things such as 
voltage rating, the capacitance value, of course, equivalent series resistance, and ripple current rating are all things that you'll want to consider when selecting an output capacitor for your application. The next component is the input capacitor. And much like the output capacitor, the input capacitor has a similar function in that it helps smooth out the voltage spikes that are caused by the rapid switching of the MOSFET. And this actually works both ways in that it wants to supply the buck converter circuit with a very clean input signal. It's also preventing any noise from propagating back upstream to our voltage supply source because that could be supplying power to other circuits on the board and we don't want that noise getting in there and disrupting their operation either. When it comes to selecting the input capacitor, the, the parameters that are important are gonna be the exact same as with the output capacitor. And the last component on our list is going to be D1, which is commonly referred to as the rectifier diode. Now, the function of the rectifier diode isn't super intuitive. One way I like to describe how it works is it's kind of like the other side of the coin of the MOSFET. So basically, when the MOSFET is off, the diode provides an alternate pathway to allow current to flow through the inductor. And actually, in some cases, you can use a MOSFET in place of the diode and create something that is called active rectification or synchronous rectification. Um, but we'll talk about that in later videos, so don't worry, it's an advanced topic. So when selecting a rectifier diode for a buck converter application, the key parameters you'll wanna be familiar with are gonna be the reverse voltage breakdown, the forward voltage drop, the current rating, and then the power dissipation rating of your diode. And that covers all of the components that make up the buck converter's power stage. Next up, we're gonna be talking about some of the key operational modes and mechanisms that actually, you know, we're gonna discuss how the buck converter actually operates, how these components work together to do the job of the voltage conversion. To understand how the circuit works, we wanna analyze it during two different conditions. One is when the MOSFET is on, the other is when the MOSFET is off. We will be using this handy circuit simulation software to do some demonstrations, and you will find a link to it in the description as well as links to the actual simulation files so that you can run them on your own computer on your own time. Okay, so condition one is when Q1, the MOSFET is on. When Q1 is closed, the current from the input source begins flowing through the inductor. And remember, because inductors have that inherent property where they like to resist any changes in the current flowing through it, the current is not going to immediately spike. So you're going to see that linear ramp that we talked about. This phase of the buck converter's operation is commonly referred to as the charging phase. So this is when the inductor will start to store energy in its magnetic field. Then the next key phase is when the MOSFET gets turned off. Upon turning off the MOSFET, the input voltage source will no longer be supplying current to the inductor. But again, just as we mentioned, the inductor has stored up some energy in its magnetic field, and it does not like the current flowing through it to change. So what it's going to do is start to release that energy in its magnetic field to try to maintain a constant level of current flowing through it. Now, of course, as it runs out of energy, the current is gonna to start to slowly dip, right? So you'll see a linear decrease now in the amount of current flowing through the inductor. But wait, there's more. Because the voltage source is no longer connected to our inductor, there, is, there isn't a pathway for the current to flow, and that's where our diode comes in. As you see, the diode provides an alternate pathway for the current to flow so that the inductor can release its stored energy. And there we see the true magic of the buck converter topology. You can think of it sort of like an orchestra of instruments are all working together to make a single sound, where you see like all of the different components are working together, you know, to step down that higher voltage to the lower voltage. So some key takeaways I wanna talk about um, from this demonstration. So number one is by opening and closing the switch periodically, we can effectively control the average current that is flowing through the inductor. The second key takeaway is going to be the average current flowing through the inductor is also going to be the average current that's flowing through our load because those two components are in series with one another. Three, the average current flowing through the inductor is also equivalent to the percentage of time that the MOSFETs is spent on, also known as the duty cycle of the MOSFET. And lastly, the voltage drop across our load is going to be equivalent to the current flowing through the load times the resistance 
of the load, you know, also known as Ohm's law. And remember, the current flowing through the load is equivalent to the current flowing through the inductor in this case. So hopefully it start, you're starting to piece it together with how the voltage actually gets dropped down. Since we can finally control the amount of current that's flowing through the inductor, we effectively can finally control the amount of current that's flowing through our load. And if we can do that, then we can control the voltage drop across our load. So I'm hoping that's kind of starting to make sense right now. But don't worry, we still have some more things to talk about to really help solidify your understanding of the buck converter. So now we're gonna run some more demonstrations using the circuit simulation software that I think will really help get you a full picture of what's going on here. So the first thing I wanna talk about is going to be what this circuit looks like on startup, right? If there's no current flowing through the inductor and the switch gets closed, kind of what, what is going on here? How does that work? So before the switch is closed, just know that the current flowing through the inductor is zero, of course, and the voltage drop across our load is zero volts. And of course, once the MOSFET is turned on, current starts flowing through the inductor and it ramps up in the linear fashion that we just talked about. And as the current through the inductor starts to ramp up, we'll see the voltage drop across our load will also start to ramp up. And basically, all we do is we wait for the voltage drop across our load to get to the desired value, and then we just simply open the switch. And then when we open the switch, then we'll see the inductor will start releasing its energy, the diode will come forward biased, and so current will start flowing through it that way, and then the voltage will start to linearly decrease. And once the voltage drop across the load has gotten too low, then we simply just close the switch again and the current will start ramping back up and the voltage will start going back up again. And then what we'll enter into is what I refer to as the steady state behavior of this circuit, which is all we do is just keep, it's a periodic opening and closing of the switch in order, and you just kind of have your, your voltage source just kind of just you know, bouncing right or really, really close to your, your nominal value that you want. Here you can see the crucial role the output capacitor plays in helping to uh, maintain that steady output voltage because it is being charged and discharged as well to kind of smooth out that voltage signal. So a couple of key things I want to point out here. So looking at the current waveform, if you took a measurement between the maximum current flowing through the inductor and the minimum current flowing through the inductor, that is what is referred to as the peak-to-peak -peak ripple current of the inductor. This number is actually chosen during the design phase. It's calculated as a percentage of the RMS current flowing through the inductor. It actually has some other impact on the design that we'll talk about in a later video, but it's just something to be familiar with, is peak-to-peak -peak ripple current. And as I mentioned earlier, hopefully this will kind of start hitting home, is that the average current flowing through the inductor is equal to the average current flowing through our load. Another observation is with the MOSFET and the diode. Notice how they each take turns carrying the current through the inductor. So basically, when one of those components is working, the other is resting. If you wanted to get an idea of how much current is flowing through the MOSFET versus the diode, the average current flowing through the MOSFET is going to be proportional to its duty cycle. And then, the average current flowing through the diode is going to be proportional to one minus the MOSFET's duty cycle. Okay, so the last section of this video is going to be some frequently asked questions that I see when we're talking about the buck converter. So the first question is going to be, what happens if during steady state operation of the buck converter, we see a change in load? Like what if the load increases or it decreases, what happens? So let's take a look at that in the simulation software. So here we're gonna have a load change of one amp to two amps. So notice whenever the load increases, the first thing that will, will happen is we'll see a significant voltage drop across our output. So what we'll do is we'll just turn the MOSFET on and then allow the current through the inductor to start to ramp up again until the voltage drop across the output reaches the specified nominal value. And then basically we go back into the steady state behavior where we are just periodically switching on and off that MOSFET to maintain that constant voltage drop across the output. The main difference I want you to note here is that what has changed is the average current through the inductor, of course, right? Because remember V equals IR. And if we have an increased load, if we want to maintain the voltage drop, then we're going to have to increase the current through the inductor. 
So that's like, that's what happens basically when your load changes in a buck converter. Another thing I want you to note is that the output capacitor will kind of hold up the voltage for us for a little bit while we let the current through our inductor ramp up. So when it comes to designing a buck converter, you'll want to take that into account where your output capacitor should be sized such that you don't see too much of a dip in your output voltage before you have time to let your inductor start to ramp up. This is actually a key design specification known as the load step response of your converter. Okay, so the next question is, what happens if the switch stays closed forever, right? Let's say what, what happens if the MOSFET stays on forever and it never switches off? So this answer is actually pretty simple. So what happens is the current through the inductor just continues to ramp up until the voltage drop across the output is equal to the input voltage, i.e. the voltage doesn't get stepped down at all in this case. So this hopefully has is a little bit intuitive for you because when it comes to understanding inductors, after a long period of time, they just look like a wire, right? So if you looked at the circuit, all you would see is the input voltage source would just be connected to the output load by a wire. So there wouldn't be any voltage step down. So yeah, so just to review the main things we covered in the video, um, to hopefully kind of wrap things up for you. I would say like the key, like Eureka moments for me when understanding how a buck converter works are going to be one, the inductor current will start at zero and it will linearly ramp up. And then we can cut it off at any time we want using that MOSFET. And two, the voltage drop across the load is equivalent to the average current through the induct, which we can finally control with the MOSFET. So I hope all of that made sense to you. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. I respond to every single comment. That is pretty much everything I wanted to talk about for an intro to the buck converter. Um, thank you so much if you made it to the end of this video, and hopefully I will see you in the next one.